that, we will go to our final speaker for this evening's symposium, uh, Miss Caroline Hickey. Uh, she will be presenting her paper, uh, Deal of the Decade, How the United States Should Handle Afghanistan in the Era of the Taliban Peace Talks. Uh, Miss Hickey is from Massachusetts and graduated in May of 2018 from Knox College in Illinois, where she self-designed her major in Middle Eastern and North African Studies. She's continuing her education at IWP, where she is pursuing a master's degree in statecraft and international affairs, and continuing her interest in the Middle East by focusing on Iraq, Afghanistan, as well as learning Arabic. Caroline, uh, with that, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you, Nathan, for that introduction. Um, I want to start off today by recognizing the anniversary of the September 11th attacks and those that lost their lives 19 years ago today. My talk today reflects how the course of history was altered that day, as I will be addressing U.S.-Taliban relations in a post-9-11 world. Uh, starting with the history of the Taliban, the Taliban are a Sunni Islamic militant group founded in 1994 by Mohammed Omar, who capitalized on Mujahideen fighters from the Soviet-Afghan war, recruiting from the ranks and utilizing their passion and experience. The Taliban's goal is to form a Sharia emirate, which briefly they briefly achieved from 1996 to 2001 when they took over the Afghan government and renamed the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The Taliban's version of Sharia law originates from Diobandi Islam, a school of thought similar to that of Wahhabi school. Since most of the original Taliban came from Pashtun tribes, they paired Diobandi Islam with their Pashto code of conduct called Pashtun Wali. This resulted in their extremist views that include their notorious harsh treatment of women. Afghans under the Taliban rule uh, suffered immensely. They banned the use of television and music, destroyed cultural heritage sites, ignored underserved citizens, and harbored the terrorist group Al-Qaeda. During the Taliban's five years in power, only three other countries recognized their government, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and United Arab Emirates. But the Taliban did not care for digital recognition, though Muhammad Omar felt that the only sovereignty that mattered was in the eyes of God. The dismissal of international law did no favors to them because 19 years ago, after the September 11 attacks, the Taliban refused to hand over the leader of al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden. This resulted in the United States forces invading Afghanistan in October 2001, and the Taliban leadership fled back to Pakistan. Since then, the Taliban have been fighting as an insurgent group and are attempting to take over the Afghan government once again. Under the leadership of Muhammad Omar, a new leadership council was established in the capital city of Keda in the Pakistani Balochistan province. By continuing to have an established and organized governance, the Taliban were able to maintain their influence. They recruited from many refugee camps around Keda. This is the revival of the Taliban and what I call the Neo-Taliban. The current rendition of the Taliban are very different than the Mujahideen fighters in the 90s. Why? Because they've gone digital. By 2005, the Taliban have embraced technology and the internet, thus abandoning their previous stances against music, television, and other technologies. Post-2001, Taliban were becoming flexible and powerful, thus why it was hard for the U.S. to fight them. The war became the longest war in U.S. history. Between 2001 and 2019, 2,400 U.S. and 1,100 NATO troops have been killed. Another 45,000 Afghan troops and police officers died from 2014 to 2019. Both sides are exhausted from fighting, but the future of, the Af of Afghanistan is at stake. Currently, Taliban numbers now stand around 60,000 fighters with, con that, with control of 18% of Afghanistan's districts. And the Afghan government is around 33% control of districts and there's a contested 29%. The Taliban are gaining support by providing Afghans with alternative security and structure than the government. This is also how they gained support in the 90s. A report done by the Asia Foundation found that in 2019, 64% of Afghans were open to reconciliation of the, with the Taliban. While reconciliation isn't full on support, this is significant change from the mindset in 2001 when the ousting of the Taliban was celebrated. Afghans were understand are understandably tired of war. They are also tired of a corrupt government. There was major frustration with the Karzai administration and the Taliban were able to feed off that. Hamid Karzai was interim president of Afghanistan from 2001 to 2004 and then elected president from 2004 to 2014. Since Karzai has left office, Afghanistan has seen some improvement with the government. The same Asia Re Foundation report found that in 2019, 66% of Afghans were satisfied with the national unity government. Alas, the survey was taken before the recent events of incumbent President Ashraf Ghani declared winner of the 2019 elections, but his rival Abdullah Abdullah also declared himself winner. The two held dual inaugurations in March 2020. 
Since then, the two have come to terms of a power sharing deal, but this obstacle has shown the instability of the Afghan government. A, f- a fracturing government is a cause for concern going into peace talks with the Taliban. The Taliban could utilize this divide to stir up more support. On the other hand, since the announcement of the death of Muhammad Omar in 2015, the Taliban have also had unstable leadership. After Muhammad Omar, Mullah Akhtar Muhammad Mansour took over but was killed in 2016 by a drone strike. Now Mawali Hatabullah Akhandazada leads it. So the peace talks, um, it is notorious that the U.S. has a policy that they do not negotiate with terrorists, and that, but there is a loophole that the Taliban are not classified by the U.S. government as a terrorist group, despite ticking all the boxes of being one. Thus, the United States and the Taliban signed a historic peace deal on February 29th, 2020. The peace deal took years in the making with a few hiccups on the way, but ultimately was signed this past February. The agreement has four parts. One, guarantees and enforcement mechanisms that will prevent the use of soil of Afghanistan by any group or individual against the United States and its allies. Two, guarantees enforcement mechanisms and announcement of a timeline for the withdrawal of all foreign forces from Afghanistan. Three, after the announcement of the guarantees for a complete withdrawal of foreign forces and the timeline in the presence of international witnesses, the Taliban will start intra-Afghan negotiations with Afghan sides on March 10th, 2020. And four, a permanent and comprehensive ceasefire will be an item of the agenda of the intra-African dialogues and negotiations. The removal of U.S. troops will happen over the course of 14 months. The terms will occur no matter what happens between the Taliban and the Afghan government. This applies more pressure to the Afghan government because now there's no backup of U.S. troops and its allies support them if negotiations do go south. It makes sense that both the U.S. and the Taliban agreed to withdraw the U.S. troops. Both parties want it to happen. The problem is trusting a terrorist organization to uphold the end of the deal. Major questions still remain, though. The U.S. can never erase the past 19 years plus and now have to face the reality of the existence of the Taliban and whatever future that holds. So how should the U.S. go about punishing the Taliban if they break the agreement? And in addition to that, how productive will the Afghan peace talks be between the two uncompromised? compromising sides. Looking at the current state of events in Afghanistan, um, all eyes are now on the Taliban and wanting to see how they depict themselves to the world. The depiction is a two sides, the same coin, violent tactics on one side and charitable political work on the other. After February 29th, the Taliban killed 83 civilians in the first two months in deliberate attacks in anticipation of the beginning of the peace talks with the Afghan government. This was in hope that these attacks will score Taliban victories in the talks. A Taliban spokesman said in regards to the incidences, we have no agreement with the Afghan government about halting our operations. And this also, and also this issue has not been discussed in the peace agreements with the Americans. We do not have any commitment with anyone about reducing the operation and this issue will be discussed in the intra-Afghan talks. Attacks on US troops have ceased, but Afghans remain the victims of Taliban assaults. This is proof that the Taliban do not have the Afghan people, people's well-being as their main priority and remain a steadfast threat to Afghanistan and its democracy. On the other hand, the Taliban have been a driving force to combat COVID-19 in Afghanistan as the virus threatens to kill more people than the war. Taliban fighters has added personal protective equipment to their standard AK-47 yielding uniforms and hosting informational workshops on how to prevent getting the coronavirus. The Taliban have a position of leadership for each Afghan province that they govern, called the Director of Health, and they have been promoting public awareness campaigns for controlling the spread of coronavirus. These educational acts for public health could strengthen the relationship between Afghan government and the Taliban. The government has welcomed these actions, and it would be unwise of them to condemn any active public relations the Taliban are doing, even from a terrorist organization. The Taliban are using this as a tactic to prove their ability as a political power and that they care for the Afghan citizens. But in a time of a pandemic as potentially catastrophic as COVID-19, it should be welcomed. They've even started letting safe passage of health workers and international NGOs to help people. This is a drastic change since the Taliban banned the World Health Organization and the Red Cross for helping Afghans in the past. Despite all the active PR efforts, some of the campaigns have been proved to be fake and the Taliban still refuse to stop fighting. It proves the potential for the adjustment of the Taliban moving from terror organization to political group, but it also proves the lack of commitment the Taliban have from straying from their violent roots. 
the, the virus pandemic comes at a very strenuous time at the Taliban-Afghan government peace talks. The Afghan government is in tatters after the contested presidential election, and the U.S. government says that they will cut $1 billion in aid as punishment and threaten to cut $1 billion more next year. The Afghan government also has to deal with copious amounts of refugees uh, arriving from Iran and their coronavirus disaster. Not only are they overwhelming the border in numbers, but they bring the virus with them and thus spreading it across the country. This has put all peace talks on hold, but it comes after a non-productive first meeting in March 2020. The talks broke down on the topic of prisoner swaps. The uncompromising attitude of both sides is the major obstacle of the talks. The specific problem and the prisoner swap should not have been negotiated by the U.S. for it was not their position to do so. But what is done is done, and the U.S. needs to figure out how to progress with these newly negotiated terms. There have been many proposals on the U.S.'s next actions, and the most important thing is not to let history repeat itself. Afghanistan cannot become a vacuum of power like it did after the Soviets left. To abandon the Afghan people now would be a slap in the face to not only a people suffering from never-ending wars, but also to the U.S. as a country that values freedom and democracy. The U.S. has put so much time and energy into attempting to transform Afghanistan into a democracy over the last 19 years, then the last 19 years would be a waste of time. What the U.S. next steps are in the relation to Afghanistan, it does depend on the outcome of the Afghan government and Taliban negotiations. But in any event of the outcome, the U.S. must continue to be diligent in reminding the Taliban that even though the international troops are not on the ground in Afghanistan, the international community will continue to monitor the situation in Afghanistan, especially surveying the Taliban. The problem with holding a totalitarian Islamic group accountable to international law and human rights law is that they do not recognize those laws as legitimate. The Taliban do not trust the international community, and if they are to succeed in a compromise with the Afghan government, there may come a time that we need, they will need to work with it or at least, at least acknowledge it. The U.S. does not have a quality reputation among Afghans or the Taliban, so the U.S. must implement damage control in order to win the hearts and minds of the people. This reputation hinders the growth of U.S. and Middle Eastern country relations in general. It also further straight thinning groups like the Taliban because they recruit heavily based on fighting the infidel. The campaign needs to incur to improve the American name in Afghanistan. It needs to consist of an information campaign aimed at cutting off the Taliban support that provides an alternative rhetoric through an information campaign, as well as funding proper education for Afghan youth. All in all, this information campaign should be aimed at delegitimizing the Taliban, improving the reputation of the U.S., and promoting the ideals of democracy. Another way the U.S. should focus on taking the Taliban down is by targeting their finances. From 2005 to 2010, the Taliban share of the opium production and trafficking grew from 90 million to 160 million. By cutting off their monetary supply, this will limit the reaches of their influence. This could be incorporated into an information campaign, the information campaign through means of highlighting Islam's views on drug usage and creating an alternative dialogue to that of the Taliban's propaganda. The Afghan economy as a whole should be improved as well. In order to have a free political arena, there should be free and stable economy. Afghanistan depends on foreign aid, but it's time to have them build up their economy depend on themselves. Give a man a fish and he's fed for a day. Teach a man to fish, he's fed for a lifetime. Afghanistan needs a lesson on how to spool the reel and barter with the fishmonger. 43.3% of the labor force in Afghanistan is agricultural, with products varying from wheat, fruits, sheepskin, and poppies. Local farmers should be encouraged to grow other crops instead of poppies to promote uh, the economy rather than the black market. The poppy market should be eradicated and, e and another equally successful but legal product should be promoted. In 2017, the unemployment rate sat at 23.9%. That is a vulnerable group of people ready for recruitment of the Taliban. If Afghanistan fortifies its own institutions and economy, it eliminates the need for the Taliban and their efforts to create an alternative government. Obviously, rebuilding an economy is easier said than done, but it should be should become a priority for the U.S. in their campaign against the Taliban. There's no one answer for how the U.S. should deal with the Taliban here on out. Only time will tell how events will unfold between the Taliban and the Afghan government, and depending on how the U.S. wants to deal with the existence of the Taliban. The events of the COVID-19 pandemic will also alter the course of history and provide new challenges for all sides. The Taliban are clearly a force to be reckoned with, but it's nothing the United States cannot handle. They need to be dealt with even after these peace talks. 
The most public and delicate part of the process is over, but to defeat one of the U.S. main adversaries, it will be a long process for the U.S. It will not happen overnight, and the U.S. must remain patient and resilient with their tactics. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline. That was very informative on something that is especially pertinent uh, today on the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Uh, moving on to the questions now, this first one is from an Elizabeth H. Uh, she asks, what is the future relationship between the Taliban and the ISI, or Pakistani intelligence? Uh, with the Pakistani intelligence, um, it's I'm not fully knowledgeable on the topic specifically of Pakistan, but from what I can tell, it's it's not trustworthy, but also don't quote me on that. Um, but it's going forward, I think Afghanistan is trying to you know, uphold their own legitimacy as their own democracy without it, outside influence, which includes Pakistan, which has been an incredible influence in the past because they want to get their way. Um, so I think probably it's going to be wary of any outside influence. Okay, thank you. This one also comes from Elizabeth H. She asks, how do the factions within the Taliban present the U.S. with opportunities to defy the Taliban and then weaken it? Factions within the Taliban, um, I think since they've grown probably over the last few years under different leadership and disagreements also between how to deal with other insurgent groups in Afghanistan definitely can be, we can, can aid us in our our act going forward, and I think would be involved in the information campaign that I mentioned to be utilized with. Okay, wonderful. Uh, our next question comes from Nicholas Dale. Is Afghanistan still a geographically relevant country to the United States vis-a-vis -vis the China Belt and Road Initiative that Jared talked about earlier, including uh, then an analysis of that in conjunction with Pakistani engagement with China? I would say so, yes. I am less uh, familiar with China's uh, initiative. Um, I would say that definitely going forward with China's desire to have more influence in the Middle East, that we are more cautious about anything involving them growing influence. And so I would say that, yes, I think that answers the question. <laughs> okay, yes, they are still relevant in your opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from Doug Howell. He asks, uh, did the Taliban break the peace agreement with the U.S. as they were continuously attacking Afghan forces and the Afghan government, who has been acting as a U.S. ally? Kind of. <laughs> That's not the best answer. I think what the Taliban claim is that the there was no negotiated ceasefire with the Afghan government. It was only with U.S. troops. And from my understanding, that was pretty much the only way we could get them to sign a peace talk, uh, a peace agreement. Um, so technically in our eyes, no, it doesn't break the agreement, uh, but it is very frustrating because it because they are our allies and technically it would be, but the allies it references in the agreement is specifically to those of like NATO. Okay. Uh I will also exercise my right to ask a question as the moderator for you. Uh, although you said there would be a 14 month long withdrawal of US forces, is there any uh, furthering of efforts then to train, arm, otherwise equip and deploy uh, Afghan forces um, during that 14 month withdrawal, uh, kind of in a mirroring of what the US intended to do in Vietnam with the South Vietnamese army in the process of Vietnamization, are we going to see an Afghanistization? I believe that is the ultimate goal is to help strengthen them, but we've been trying to do that also for the past 19 years and it hasn't fully succeeded. So I'm not sure what at least also, it's an election year, so, you know, administrations could alter how it goes forward, but I'm not, I don't think it's a major priority either. It doesn't seem like, it seems like we just want to get out, which is what I talked about, which is the fear of another vacuum. 
And to follow along to that point of creating another vacuum, uh, and especially in light of the earlier question then on China and their increasing role in the Middle East, uh, how are external partners, um, or maybe not partners, just external nations going to take advantage of a vacuum if there is one, specifically in light of other great power competition with China, Russia, or other partners, possibly even like the EU, Saudi Arabia, etc. I think most of our allies will probably just take our lead. Um, I think the major concern would be China probably because of their recent desire to move into the region. I wouldn't worry about Russia as much just because of the history with the Soviets and Afghans that I think Afghanistan wouldn't let that happen. I think the other concern would be potentially Iran um, entering the arena, even though currently I would say that they're more focused west of their country than east. There isn't really much that is known to be going on between Iran and the Taliban, especially they don't particularly get along as well. Um, So I would say the major concern would continue to be China. Okay. Thank you. Uh, We have no further questions uh, lined up, uh, either on the Zoom or on the Facebook. So Caroline, I thank you for taking the time uh, to present and to answer uh, the various array of questions that were asked of you uh, across a wide variety of topics related to Afghanistan. Uh, So big thank you to Caroline, but also big thank yous to Jared and Phoebe for joining us today, for sharing your research. And thank you also to all of you who tuned in, either on the Zoom or on Facebook. If you are interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us.